Good evening. I've been teaching and practicing as an architect for about 25 years. And I find that um, there's always a polarized conversation between the idea that the purpose of schools of architecture is to produce what have been called oven-ready architects, the students who are already competent in all of the skills required to start off as practitioners, and the requirement of the ar architectural practices for students to reach that benchmark. And the sense inside schools, where often there are very, very few practitioners teaching, that the school is a liberal intellectual institution whose purpose is experimentation and speculation, and it owes no such duty to practice. It seems to me that that polarization is very problematic, and I want to talk about another idea of what architectural education might be like. And the simple proposition I want to put forward is that the day you come into first year and start as a student, you begin as an architectural practitioner who has a duty to the world of architectural practice, and you also begin to learn. And you don't stop that learning practice until you retire. And the sense of a lifetime learning is what I'd like to make this evening's uh, short talk about. To begin with, I would like to praise the people who taught me. In Dublin, we came from the farms and the bogs and the suburbs, and we absolutely hadn't a clue. We were 17, and we met Shane de Blockham, who had just finished as project architect on, Paul, uh, on Louis Kahn's Paul Mellon Center. Coming from this extraordinary project, he inherited us and had to teach us how to be architects. The sense of vocation that he gave us, the sense that we had a duty to architecture, is something that I have carried with me throughout my whole life. And you can see the work that Shane de Blockham did in Trinity College Dublin, its debt to Louis Kahn. And they say, in, um, the Jesuits say, give me a boy for the first uh, seven years of his life and I have the man. This is a project which we have recently finished in Cambridge for Jesus College. The sense of continuity of ideas through that is something that comes when you're taught by a practitioner who's completely immersed in the subject. I had the pleasure in my third year of being taught by these two women here, Yvonne and Shelley, who at the end of third year drew up outside my house in a battered old Renault 4 and said they were going to take my drawings and put them on exhibition in Dublin with a couple of other students because we as students had something to say to the city. It's no surprise to me that those people who'd no work back then in 1982 are now doing some of the most interesting work in the world, in cities around the world, and that they're cur curating the Venice Biennale. Their sense of responsibility to the discipline and the idea that, stu that students and architects have something to say to the city is central. I was taught by Robin Walker, who in 1946 brought Ove Arup over to these islands for the first time to make this extraordinary building at Basaris. He had studied with Hilbersheimer and Mies van der Rohe, and the sense of continuity from those masters through to our generation was brought by, by, by practitioners like him. And finally, John Toomey and Sheila O'Donnell, who taught me in my fifth year, are IBA gold medalists, who still continue to teach through all of the success of their practice, and who see teaching as being absolutely central to what they do. To me, this is an idea of practice and teaching together, which means that the polarization I, speak of, uh, I spoke of at the beginning is impossible. My own practice, which began in a flat in Portobello Road, some of you might have noticed the electric cinema on the left-hand side there, had students on the balcony mixing concrete from the beginning. The sense of making and studying and practicing was central to what I did. I wasn't part of an architectural scene, and so my world was students and builders. And we did projects where we would build quite ambitious things. I want as a case study to show you one of them a tiny island off the west coast of Ireland, which is almost inaccessible, with a 6th century chapel on it. The students visited it um, and sur surveyed this ancient chapel. They made beautiful drawings of the chapel, and then they wanted to make a place on the island. Once a year, they have a mass on the island. They wanted to make a place to store the utility goods for the mass and the altar. So they made these lovely measured drawings of the fantastic Cyclopean stonework, and then turned it into this beautiful model where they suggested that a building could be made just from the mortar joints. Technically, it was extremely ambitious, but working with Tim Lucas, the engineer, they looked at thinner and thinner ways of casting concrete, and eventually, using robotics, were able to uh, create every single stone in the church from um, po po polystyrene, and then cast the joints, working with precasters, working with the, uh, the Here East and the Bartlett at UCL, um, and creating these extraordinary lightweight structures, which they would then blow the insulation out of, so you got this very, very delicate lace work. It was a project where they had to raise the money, persuade local people to build it, uh, get planning consent, and manufacture uh, the, 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 the project in a year as a completely collective endeavor. 
Very sadly, at the last moment, the Galway planners said they couldn't put it on the site in Galway, and it's now stuck on a site in Camden. You might recognize the tower block in the background. Um, and you can see it here in the railway sidings. The tenacity of the students is amazing. Two years after that project is complete, I'm going over next week to Galway to attend the inauguration of this chapel on the shore after two years of work by the students. But here it was in its temporary home in County Camden. Um, and this lovely piece of lichen on the, on, on, on the stone which the students got and turned into dye uh, and then made a fabric through which you could see the stonework through this lichen dyed uh, uh, linen. The brief which we've written for our students this year is called The Protagonist, and I felt that with the, with the year that we have behind us, it was worth making a call to arms to the students. We said to them, architecture has a fight on its hands. In London, there's a looming sense of crisis about the role of the architect and the relationship between construction expertise and public life. The mainstream media has openly questioned the role of architects in the creation of just and well-integrated urban communities. Architects are often seen as cowed servants and tools of a dominant and predatory capitalist mode of production. Equally, on the other hand, they're accused of unrealistic forms of idealistic or liberal thinking at odds with the realities of the contemporary economy and construction culture. This alleged balance of, of, of powerless and impracticality is deeply corrosive of the discipline of architecture. And we asked the, the students to think, how is it that they would be able to put themselves at the central, of the central to the discipline of architecture in the future? We said they need as students to put forward projects that speak to architectural practice in a way which is between what is possible to imagine and what is possible to do, that they occupy a unique space. And I just want to show you some of the projects very briefly, which they did. Uh, the reclad uh, the, the re tower blocks at Mornington Crescent are thought about by Gracie here, completely changing the plan so that you can make larger units with double height spaces in them around the same core uh, by, by, con by constructing out from the basic frame in CLT. And the plans have been worked out in great detail to show how these units can work. A beautiful scheme to link um, the top of um, Primrose Hill uh, with UCL through um, a journey which is equal to Nash's journey and includes Euston Station reconstructed for HS2 as a new circular park which links all of the platforms from HS2, the new lines coming in, and the tube lines together. Uh, this is a lovely view of the arcade around the center of that central park, um, which is the, the center piece of it. This beautiful project taking old pieces of newspaper and making them into structural uh, ties uh, through, through weaving them and bonding them, and then making a community-based project which slices through Euston Station and connects two sides of the station together. And finally, a beautiful scheme which turns the connection between all the lines in Euston Station, including HS2 and the deep northern line, into a park through which you can connect between the different platforms. This is imaginative thinking, something that couldn't be thought about necessarily in practice, but which students can say, why not? We appear to have resolved a lot of the problems and to offer these as, as possibilities to practice. In addition to that, I'd like to say that what we've done is to try and create a mutual community out of all the students who we've taught and all of the people who have worked in the practice. And this is a list of people who are in that community. It includes myself, but also lots of other people who are part of our world. And that sense that we continue to support each other as a mutual group through the years of our lives and to educate each other becomes part of the business of teaching. They come back and help to teach my students. I can also ring them up and ask them questions about things that I don't understand, but I'm the gray hair who can help them with problems that they come across for the first time. So it's a way of thinking collectively together about the relationship between people who've studied together. I just want to show some of the, uh, the, the, the projects which we've done in practice recently. One which was just mentioned, which is in Auckland Castle, which is a new visitor center. It's a timber tower which will look into this thousand-year castle. And the idea of it is that it will tell the story of the landscape and the castle over time. It took a year of uh, 20 meetings with Historic England to persuade them that we could build a tower on the site. But using the image of a siege engine, we succeeded in persuading them. And the tower will be, will be bedecked with these enameled panels which show the development of the buildings over a 1,000 years. The structure itself will eventually allow you to go to the top and to look down on the landscape, which includes an old Nor Norman fort and a 1,000 years of other kinds of fortification. And you can see it here being built at the moment. It's due for completion in about a month's time. The timber frame of the tower is up there, put up against the walls of the castle. And we can see the sense of this timber frame as it stands overlooking the castle without quite being finished yet. 
The next project I want to talk about is one at Jesus College in Cambridge, which is an insertion of new buildings into an old building by the architect Morris Webb. And it's working a lot with existing building stock, some of it decent building stock from the 1970s and some of it significant historic stock. The, the college wanted a new entrance through which they could see uh, present themselves publicly out to the city, and this is what we've made. This 1970s building has been completely reclad. The old brick bone structure has been completely reclad in oak um, to make, to make uh, auditoria and hotel rooms for the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the college. And then this is the new view looking into the quadrangle. You can see the old brick bones um, of, the building, of, 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 of the old building in the background. And then this gives some sense of the interior connecting together 1970s architecture, uh, 1930s architecture, and a, a new proposal which I'll show you in a moment which is not yet built, and the existing building which we've made. So connecting together past and future in various phases. This is a new auditorium which will be the next phase which we begin to build, which is based on a high space in which you can change the acoustic by opening and closing the shutters. And this gives you some sense of the interior of that space when it's finished. And the last project I want to talk about, because also it's this idea of linking together um, to people in the more recent past. We had a beautiful site in Oxford next door to a fantastic building by Richard McCormack, um, a building I loved and which had been much neglected. And we said the first task of our building is to revive the Sainsbury building by Richard McCormack. The lake which is by his building has been connected to ours. It's an auditorium framed around a stone building. The interior is very simple with a timber, an oak pergola, um, giving you a foyer, and off it there's a, uh, um, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a stone amphitheater. Looking into the stone amphitheater is a ceiling which is designed to, uh, to assist the acoustics and very simple benching on the stone amphitheater. Uh, the benching is double curved so you can sit on it for more than two hours without feeling very uncomfortable um, and giving you a sense then of what that space is like. So these are contemporary projects in the practice uh, based very much on an idea of an understanding of craft. But what we're doing as well is that we have a practice, we've set a, ta a target to take 20% of all of our net profits and to put it back into research as a way of re-educating ourselves and allowing us to think and reflect about what we're doing. Some of the research is incredibly straightforward. This is one piece of material-based research which is looking at all of the timber buildings we've built for 25 years and asking ourselves how the materials age over time, taking snapshots after six months, a year, five years, 10 years, and asking, can you, can you design the building to be something which weathers in a way which you intended, rather than that being an accidental outcome of what you do? I'll give a prize to anybody who can tell me what's happening on the right-hand side photograph of that door. Um, the other kind of simple research work which we've done is often about making collective projects which are for our pleasure together. Uh, a little chapel we designed in Oxford, but just between doing the working drawings and the construction of the project, we set aside time to go to University College Dublin to take an old Georgian room and to do what the medieval masons used to do, which is to pour lime, uh, pour pa 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 plaster of Paris onto the floor and make a drawing table. So the white you see there is the old floor of the building, which has been turned into a drawing table. And we spent a week together just making that drawing. If you ask me what it's for, I can't tell you. I can tell you that two of the people in the photograph got married afterwards, so that's a good outcome. <laughs> and then that's the roof above the plan that you would have seen beneath you a moment ago. That's the roof of the chapel at Cubston. And that idea of reflecting on work which we've done, we did a building for people with dementia, and the building had many um, conceptual difficulties after it was finished, and I wanted to go back and think about it again. We set up a project with 20 ex-students who are now in practice to try and draw the building as you might if you were, uh, uh, as, as, as you might understand it if you were somebody with dementia. We as architects understand the world allocentrically. We can draw a plan and see all of the parts of the building all at once. For someone with dementia, that entirely collapses. Their ability to know where they've come from and where they've gone begins to erode, and their ability to situate themselves in the, in, in the world disappears. We wanted to draw the building as it might be experienced by them. We brought the people together, practitioners, to make this collective drawing. And here are four of us drawing four people sitting at a dining table together. Um, so the, the, the act of drawing became um, um, a, a way of thinking about the building. And this is a project we did for three or four months before we brought it to Venice, to the Biennale. Uh, the whole drawing was turned into a, a huge digital construction. These are the data cables coming down from the roof with 56 speakers giving you a sound environment. And then the drawing itself is something which enacts itself over 24 hours on the floor. 
um, showing the life of the building and the way in which the plan of the building is constantly trying to emerge and collapse as, as it's experienced by the people who use it. These are some details of the garden as it turns through the seasons from summer to spring to winter and so on. And you can see the sense of this projected drawing as being something which changes all the time. So this is the outcome of a much deeper piece of research where we've been interviewing people about dementia for four or five years now, neuroscientists, anthropologists, care workers, and we've built that up as a website, which is a resource for all architects to go to, to learn more about dementia if they want to understand it. And this piece here is the drawing, which is the other outcome of that project. And finally, what I'd like to do is to end with the project which we recently completed in Venice, which is looking at a number of our own buildings and trying to think about them collectively in the office and make a piece which understands them. This is us working together on the floor of the office to try and construct the piece as a team of students, architects, practitioners, and so on, working and learning together. I made this sketch coming back from Jaipur, where I'd seen the observatory, the idea of a table which turns around. And as you turn the table, a little armature on the left-hand side makes the lights tilt so the sun can uh, rise and set as you turn the table. Uh, we had this wonderful team of people in the office who made all of the models for us. And they're a way of going back to our older projects and remaking them in the sense as the idea of what they should have been. And you see these uh, models coming together on a map of the cosmos. This is the wonderful team of people who made the models looking, uh, sitting around their finished pieces and it was brought to Venice. You can see the table here, which can be turned by hand. The lights on the left-hand side will change angle and color temperature to give you the changing of the day. On the perimeter of the building, we have all the social calendars of all the buildings that we had, from a world rugby building, which has got the rugby fixtures, to a chapel, to a fish restaurant, which has got all the in-season fish. So we have the annual calendar. And the little armature you see there makes the sunrise and set. You can see the buildings here as you would turn them around. And I'll leave you with a little image um, or a film if it comes up of the piece as it moves around and you can watch the day turning through 24 hours. Thank you very much.